looks like Donna's on, but not her video. Wait a minute. He's on twice. Okay. All right. We're good. Uh, is Donna's video off? There oh, she goes. There she is. Hey, hey. You know what? We, we all look the same. <laughs> all right, Sydney, go for it. Let's hear it. Okay. Yeah, well, first of oops. Wrong one, wrong button. Okay, so uh, Cynthia, did we lose the young lady in the back? No, I think she's still here. I just gotta go get her. Okay, because I just, I can't see back there too far, so. Um, what was that? Just a ding. Right. I'm hearing, I hope I don't hear that duck quack. What, I'm sorry? The duck quack, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, here, we're good now. Okay, here we go. So where I left off was that everything is energy and everything is controlled by energy. So that's pretty much the direction that we're going to go in and now. Uh, before I start my uh, PowerPoint, I just want to give you this little bit more information, about, especially about my pop-up, because he's huge to everything I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. My pop-up was Penobscot Indian. And I said he was born in Maine on the Penobscot Island. They want to call, they call it an island. It's not an island if you've ever been there. Uh, but anyway, he lived there until he was 22, uh, 22 years old. Uh, at the age of 22, he moved off the reservation, moved to Bridgeport, Connecticut, made my grandmother, got married. There you go. So my grandfather was a very bad alcoholic. Um, the Penobscots are very poor. They were not a casino tribe, still are not. And uh, so they didn't have jobs. They really didn't have anything to do. There was a lot of depression and a lot of drinking. So unfortunately, my life with him revolved around the fact that my grandmother would throw him out because he was drunk and uh, he would be sent to the Milford Police Department where my father was a police officer. My police, my father would have to go pick him up, how embarrassing, bring him back to our house for like three days of detox. And then he would go back to my nanny. So wash, rinse, repeat over and over and over again. So it was during this time, one of these times, this is how he happened to be at the house. And when I was in kindergarten to have that conversation with me in the car. So, um, now, I wanted to make sure you knew a little bit about him so you understood where I came from. When I was in seventh grade, this is where everything pretty much came together for me and really changed. Uh, one of my favorite science teachers, uh, Mr. Jurasco, was talking about the law of conservation of energy. Now, that's a uh, law created by Albert Einstein. For those of you who know what it is, for those of you who don't, uh, law of conservation of energy states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can be manipulated and altered but energy itself cannot be created. And it's been here you know, since the beginning of time. So he starts explaining to us about this law. And he says that you know, every biologist, every theorist, every um, physicist, they all agree that we are energy beings. What makes us live, what makes us do what we can do, which makes us survive is our energy. And that this energy has been here since the beginning of time. So if, energy cannot be created and we're energy beings, then does it make sense that Donna just to get one time to have this candy coated shell, this physical body, she just gets the one time from, on, in all the, all the millennium from the beginning of time to the end of time, even past this dies. Does it make sense that Donna just gets to live once? You know, that this is the point, and, and Cynthia's heard it, this is the point where usually in my presentations up to the last, like say eight months, I would have said, I don't know. Um, this is the theory people use for reincarnation. This is the theory that doesn't make sense that Donna, Donna would just get the one time to be Donna, right? I have asked my loved ones, my grandmother, grandma, are you grandma for me, but somebody else for somebody else? And I don't get an answer. So... But I've always said that the science is there to support it. Absolutely, the science is there, but I just wasn't quite there yet. It wasn't. And, uh, but recently, like I said, in the last, last eight months, I really put a lot of education to a lot of reading, a little research. And honestly, my biggest help came from uh, astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, who I'm actually friends with. 
But anyway, so he just, you know, he puts everything together in better words than I can for the philosophy of how this whole thing, you know, could happen. And we're going to talk about that when I do the PowerPoint. So now I have been looking and I will say I have seen things in my own life. I've been able to visualize and visit, revisit areas of my own life where I can see where I've lived multiple times. And I, so I've done a lot of education to the theory about it, the cultures that believe in it, how long it's been believed in the science to support it. Um, and that's really what the PowerPoint is, is, about, is, is about. I am going to tell you my own personal story. Peggy's going to share hers as well about some of our reincarnation um, experiences that I have been able to, to validate. Um, and same thing with past life regression. You know, people will use that term back and forth. Reincarnation means the ability to reincarnate again into another body. That's reincarnation. Mm -hmm. The past life regression is the ability to be able to remember each of these lives. So it's different, but yet they mimic the same traits. And there's a reason for that. Wouldn't they mimic the same traits? But so we're going to go through that as well. So with that being said, I'm listening to my teacher talk about this energy, you know, not being created or destroyed. And he says, so when, you know, if energy can't be destroyed, then technically, technically we can't die. This does, but this doesn't. And my brain went, that's what my pop up was trying to explain to me in that car so many years ago at six years old. He would not have known this theory. He was not a learned man. They didn't really have schools, but he knew. So, you know, that day changed my life and all the reading and stuff I've done since then. The information is out there. The information on what happens to us after we die, it's been written for well over 100 years. It's very well documented with stories and proof and analytics and everything else. So, uh, you know, when people say to me, oh, I don't understand, I don't, I want to, whatever happens with that, are we here? Are we butterflies? Are we this? I don't know why we're all being so dense. It's there, it's in writing. Now, we're not taught about it, it's not put in the school curriculums. What about our aura? It's responsible for everything, our energy. I've done my understanding your aura presentation for this library before, and I'm very passionate about that. Our energy, which is responsible for everything, goes everywhere with us before, during, and after. Okay, we don't, we don't leave it. It's so, it's so responsible for everything that it's so important to us. So when we're in school, we're learning about thermal energy, and kinetic energy, and chemical energy, and mechanical energy, and all these energies. Why aren't we taught about biological energy? And the first thing people used to say to me is, oh, Sydney, I learned about the DNA and the splicing of No, 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 no. I'm talking that about the depths of us that makes us who we are. The essence, the energy that actually makes the heart pump, that makes the brain produce neurotransmitters, that makes the medulla oblongata allow us to breathe. That's what I'm talking about. That's not taught in school, that essence. Why? It's, in my opinion, it's more important than knowing if I put two chemicals together, I'm going to get a chemical reaction. But if you think about it, if we knew about our energy and all the wonderful things that we could do, I mean, we have it, it's there, it's just kind of like sitting dormant, our lives would be completely different. Donna, if you knew, say you were a blue aura, just say you're blue, I don't know what you are, let's say you were a blue aura, Donna. If you knew since the time when you were born and you were educated about it, that certain people, harm your body, just be being around them. Just by being around them, you don't have to talk to them, you don't have to even know them. Certain places hurt your energy, drain your energy. Certain situations that you are predisposed to certain types of cancers just because you're a blue aura. That would change your life completely. You'd make better choices, maybe hang around with different kinds of people, avoid certain situations. And why would we wanna be healthier? And why would we wanna understand and again, ORS has been written about since at least 140 years back. So, I mean, early 1700s, they were talking about something that was the aura that we know the aura now, so it's not new. So everything we're going to discuss tonight, reincarnation, everything has to do with energy. Your energy is responsible for it. That's why knowing your energy, your aura is extremely important to all this. So now the PowerPoint, if I can find it. Oh, I hope it opens up. Let me know, Peggy, when um, you can see it. I can see it. I, I can see it, but see it's got to it. be bigger. There we go. Is that better? It's perfect. No, it's not the full screen. Well, it's it shows full screen for me. 
You have to click enable editing and then click on um, slideshow and start slideshow. Well, how do I get that's how do I get that? I mean, I just did the same thing I always do. Okay, so how do I how do I get out of here now? Hold on. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second and I'm gonna come back. All right, try this again. Where'd it go? Uh, try this, share. Okay, so that better, Peg? Yes, yes. perfect. It's there. Okay. All right, now hopefully I can read it. Okay, so, okay, so reincarnation, don't make the same mistakes twice. That's kind of funny. I mean, if you think about it, but you know, it's it's kind of true. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk about different things, different cultural, religious influences is what I start with. But just to show you how this is not new, how we are all feel and have experienced the same things and how everybody has a belief, no matter where you come from, in some type of an afterlife. And they've actually experienced it to some degrees. But I'm going to have to move you guys back and forth because you're blocking my words. OK, so cultural, religious, religious influences throughout time, throughout many aspects of our lives, our culture or religious affiliation has affected what we believe, how we live and how we think. This topic is no different. So, but why is it learning about the possibility of reincarnation is so important? Well, I can think of 20 reasons about this. But, and why is reincarnation such a mystery? I'm gonna tell you, it's not a mystery. It also, from the research I've done, is very well documented. So it's not a mystery, we're just not told about it. As a matter of fact, we're told the opposite, that it doesn't exist and leave it alone, it'll go away. So let's go back to in the beginning. The subject of reincarnation has been documented in some format or another in virtually every culture and religious text. They differ on thoughts regarding the science that supports it or rejects its, its existence, as well as what different cultures believe. But these subjects fill library and store shelves. And I'm sure the um, Hageman Library also has many resources on the afterlife or past life regression, right? And theory. Of course they do. So we're just going to talk about different cultures. Now you got the Mayans, and I love this photo, so I had to put it up there. It's one of my favorite. It just means a lot to me. Okay, so the Mayan people believe that they descend. Bless you. Yeah, right. Someone's making someone's making me sneeze. Uh, my nose is uh, The Maya, bless you. The Mayans believe that they descend from a maze people created by this god, and his name is. I had to look it up and say it correctly. Popalvu. They actually said it that way. Popalvu. Okay, they call themselves the children of the corn, and as corn can be harvested and the nibs replanted, this allowed for multiple rebirths in which they had the ability to live plentiful and rich lives. So they saw themselves as like an ear of corn, but they saw themselves as the ability to be able to replant and to relive plentiful and rich lives. So that was uh, because they felt they were descended from this pop hell boom. <laughs> I just like saying that name. Okay, so the Induits. Induits, you know, I tell you what, this is where I usually stop here because when I did a lot of investigating for other reasons for the Induits, the Induits by the Western society are thought of as stupid people. They're just dumb. They don't know, oh, they're weird medicine. Oh, they're weird way of thinking. They're just, they're not educated. She's just a smart. I got to tell you, they're one of the smartest people that ever existed on the planet. Most of the things that Inuits use for medicine or for knowledge or for craftsmanship or anything like that, we use today in a refined manner. So they weren't stupid. They're not stupid. They're actually very, very smart. But because they appear to be uneducated, because they didn't have the formal training and the high degrees and stuff like that, I really got very annoyed when studying the Inuits of how people refer to them as um, ignorant people, because they are not. The Inuit people believed in a soul and a body for both animals and humans. They believe that at the time of death, the body separates from the soul and becomes useless. Yeah, there it goes. It's the body that dies. However, the soul of the person remains on earth and continues in another body, usually in the same family. Now, I will tell you what I found when I do this research is there is a larger amount of support for the fact that we reincarnate back into the same family um, than we do, say, in some other type of family. But it can happen, but it's usually in the same family. Eskimos, as part of their culture, Eskimos would name their newborn baby after a recently deceased person, usually related. In fact, they were thought to be conceived as the deceased in a new shape as the reincarnation with the same characteristics, memories, likes, and dislikes. 
So they even went to the extent of saying, okay, I'm pregnant with the person that just died and they're gonna be a new person, which I thought that was awesome. Religion, Hindu. Based on the Dr. Karma, you know, I want to talk about this for a second because people use where all karma is going to get you. What people understand is karma doesn't mean it's going to get you in this life. <laughs> okay, it doesn't. You can wait. The person's going to die. You're never going to see it. Karma was meant to mean that the bad energy, the bad stuff you did that you're going to have to face will happen in the next life, not in this life. So just I like to give people definitions of words. So based on the doctrine of karma, the law of cause and effect, which states that what one does in the present life will have an effect in the next life. The process of birth and rebirth or transmigration of souls is endless until one achieves moksha or liberation or release. Most never really uh, reach that state. So what the Hindus believe in is that we just keep having rebirth, this transmigration of souls. It's endless and you keep going, you keep going, you keep going until you reach this uh, liberation or release. There are pinnacles, what they call pinnacles, to get to that. If anybody has ever studied the um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, most people never reach self-actualization. Well, the Hindus felt the same way. Most people never reach that true, perfect light, no mistakes, perfect insight, everything. So they just keep reliving the lives over and over and over and over again. And what I did not put in here, and I'm going to have to add to my PowerPoint, is they also felt it would be into the same family. Buddhism. Reincarnation is a standard belief amongst Buddhists. The continuation of the soul through multiple lives is paramount. The Tibetan Buddhism, because it is different, believe that beings are born on different realms of existence, like animal realms, human realms, godly realms, and ghost realms, depending on the karma, once again, they created in other lives. Each life offering an opportunity to correct one's karma and change their direction into a new realm. So look at all these different cultures and, and religions now that do believe in reincarnation, yet we're all scratching our heads. Judaism, now I gotta tell you, this shocked a lot of my friends who are Jewish because they didn't believe me and they had to look it up themselves and they were very shocked. The Torah, which means to teach, has many references to reincarnation. The revolving of the souls are gil and gilm, and I'm never gonna say it twice the right way, with its pages, um, it's, that's, the, that's the revolving the souls with its pages. However, many Jews are surprised to learn of this as it's not commonly taught in recent times. There are many stories of reincarnation, one being of Ramban, a seminal figure in Jewish history who himself was re repeated multiple times, um, reincarnated multiple times. So let me, I'm going to explain this to you a little bit because I really had to delve into this. The Torah, the Bible, um, a lot of religious texts were changed and were altered. That's just fact. I mean, they don't even hide it. One of the teachings in the Torah before it was removed, especially with the story about Ramban, is the fact that the revolving of the souls or reincarnation was in there written all over the place, but it was removed. So modern day people of the Jewish faith, they weren't taught that, they didn't know it. So when I went to my Jewish friends and asked them about it, they're like, oh no, no, they actually teach us no, there is no reincarnation. So when I asked them to look into what I found, they were actually a little annoyed because they themselves felt there was a reincarnation. They felt it in their gut. They felt it had to be a possibility or they felt that they were reincarnated. And actually their faith taught that at one time until people felt the need to remove it from the Torah. Why did they feel the need to remove it? Christianity. Christianity sprung from Judaism and many of the writings from the Hebrew texts were brought forward into Christian belief. The modern discussion right now of reincarnation is, oh, no, 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 no. Discussions of reincarnation versus resurrection. They'll talk about resurrection, no reincarnation, resurrection. If you think to yourself, what's the difference? But the, the, the Christian faith will go toward more of a resurrection, but the no, no on the reincarnation. However, multiple stories from Job in the original Hebrew text were removed from King James and subsequent Bibles. There was multiple stories of, of Job and Abraham in the Bible and, and many others where they talked about reincarnation, feeling they were reincarnated and who they were before in their family, but that was removed from the King James and subsequent Bibles, just like the Torah. Why is that? And one of the most famous things that Job said was, naked came I out of my mother's womb, naked shall I return hither. So what does that mean? I came out of my mother's womb, but then I'm going to return so they can be reborn again. 
The science, we've talked about now culture, we talked about religion, let's talk about science. Another name I'm gonna have a hard time saying, Phagosaurus, which is actually the name, Socrates and Plato's knowledge were very highly regarded during their, this, their time. However, many are unaware of their place in today's teaching on science, mass, energy, medicine, and disease. They were at the forefront of it, kind of like the Inuits. Reincarnation or transmigration was an integral part of their teachings and were based upon the way the soul slash energy and the body are two separate entities. One with the ability to be viable and the other, the body not, carcass. Okay, so even these modern teachers or these not modern teachers were teaching this about um, transmigration and reincarnation and about the separation of the body from the energy or the soul, whichever word you want to use. More science, quantum theorists. And I gotta tell you, when I saw this, I was like, not quantum theorists, they don't get into stuff like this. Oh yes, they do. Max Planck, undeniably, and undeniably the most famous quantum theorist, says, yes, reincarnation does exist. He is supported with this claim by multiple other theorists who base this on the very scientific rationale that quantum mechanics allows for a consciousness to live on following the body's death. This information is stored on microtubules in the cells, I can't talk, completely separate from the need of a physical source for survival. These cells can be placed into a new host with some memory recall, some moral or traits and markers. So now you've got quantum physics jumping in and saying, these people really shouldn't be looking at this kind of thing, but they do, especially this man. He wrote books, tons of books on this stuff and about the fact that, again, we don't look at it as a microtubule kind of thing with our cells, but basically all you have to understand is that micro microtubules are still, they're still energy. And what it's saying is the energy, the life can still live on without the need for a physical source, a carcass for survival. So our energy is still here. And then they can be placed into a new host, a new person with some memory recall, similar traits and markers. Neuroscience. Many neuroscientists and psychologists have looked at the memories and thoughts of people who claim to have been reincarnated. The verdict, verdict? here's just one example. After studying over 3,000 people with claims of multiple lives, much respected professor of psychiatry and neurology, Dr. Ian Stevenson, shared scientific research with others in the community that left many skeptics having to come, I spelled it wrong, sorry, to terms with the possibility that reincarnation is real. This particular neurologist slash psychologist, Dr. Ian um, Stevenson said, memories and consciousness are retained and separate from the vessel. So here we go again. Memories and consciousness are retained. They don't go anywhere. Memories are separate from the vessel. This is just a carcass. This is a covering. This is a candy coated shell. This only lasts so long. This helps us function and move around. But this is what keeps us alive. All right. And this is common. You're seeing over and over and over again. <laughs> Albert Einstein. I like him. He's my dude. Him, him and um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, I got to tell you. Albert Einstein was brilliant. I mean, the man was brilliant, crazy, absolutely crazy. He's not quite right, but he was brilliant. His theory, the law of conservation of energy, or more widely known as energy cannot be created or destroyed, is the theory mostly supported as the explanation of life after death. Energy is constant, but can be manipulated and can be changed. To be clear, Einstein did not vocalize an agreement for, for or against reincarnation, but his theory says it all. So I want to explain something to you here. Einstein, and again, you can read this for yourself at your local library because your like local library is filled with all sorts of wonderful knowledge, especially about everything we're talking about. But Albert Einstein created the theory, as we said, which explains the afterlife. It not only explains the afterlife, it explains scientifically reincarnation. His partners, his other scientists said, dude, I don't know if they called him dude, but I'm going to call him dude. Hey, dude, you just came up with a science that supports the afterlife. Nah, nah, you die, you go in the ground, the ants crawl all over you, you're dead, you're done with. He didn't believe in the afterlife until, there's always an until. He had an abdominal lead or aortic aneurysm. It ruptured, he died. And believe it or not, read the story. I had to read it three times because I'm a nurse. The doctor used cellophane tape to tape the tear up 
and he did come back to life. I forget he was out, I think four minutes. He was out completely, totally out four minutes. When he came back, he told his son who sat by his bed. Now his son wrote the notes for him because he was too weak about the things he experiences, the place that he went the things that he was able to do all at the same time, the fact that he could be with people who have passed away that he knew, it like 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 in life, and he was still able to see the people, the things that were going on around him now, the doctor's work, the nurses coming in the room, his son being there. He said, I was in several different worlds at one time. So now he believed in reincarnate, and oh, no, sorry, he, now he believed in the afterlife. This is a man who said, no, 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 no. What happened was the doctor said, look, if I don't go back there and fix you with the cell, when take the cell phone tape off, you're going to have, it's going to rupture again and you're going to die. He said no. And uh, they did not do the extra surgery and he wound up having a rupture and he did die. So, I mean, I don't know why he chose not to have it done, but that's not the point. The point is here's a man who didn't believe in the very theory that explains everything until he had his own experience. So no, to be clear, he did not vocalize an agreement for or against reincarnation but he also didn't originally agree with the afterlife, but his theory says it all. And it's his theory that still stands today. Nobody's challenged it. Nobody's even tried to because it works. So what's in the word? So here we've looked at culture, we've looked at religion, we've looked at science, um, and we've looked at a whole bunch of other things. So what's in the word? So let's look at the word, the meaning of the word. Re means to repeat. In is internal or aside, as in making of a person or thing. The essence, the personality trait or characteristic. Carnation, born into the flesh. And as just so you know, the carnation is the flower of death. So to repeat the essence of the personality or the traits of a person is born back into the flesh. Reincarnation. That's where the word comes from. The word really says it, says it all, as far as I'm concerned. So why is the denial? Like with many beliefs, decisions have been made for us on what is reality and what is not. Remember when I told you about the fact that biological energy, the knowledge, knowledge of auras has been around for a long time, but yet we're not taught about it. We're taught about other things. So if the decisions were made for us on what is reality, what's not, what exists and what doesn't. Throughout history, we have, been, we have learned that many of our things that we were taught in our school, church, even our homes are not based upon facts, but I'm more of an acceptable and easier to believe mantra. Believing against the norm was and is seen as defiance or an act of rabble rousing. We know that information about many not, not, non-mainstream topics such as our auras, the afterlife, aliens, and now reincarnation has been blocked, rewritten or erased from literature and obviously blocked from curriculums, as I said. So, you know, you have to look at this and think to yourself, are we crazy? The stuff supports, honestly, stuff supports aliens. I'm not that quite there yet. Honestly, I think we're the aliens, but that's all right. But there's so many things that are going on out there that we're like, aha, what a hoax, you're a joke. And honestly, there's a lot of science to back it up, but we're told, no, look the other way. Don't look over here, but just, you know, keep, keep on. Why is that? Why are we being blocked? Why are books being rewritten and being erased, things being erased from literature? Gotta ask yourself, why is this? So let's talk. And I think that that is, yeah, okay. So here's my website. We're gonna talk a little bit. Uh, please follow me on Facebook. And I do have a new business page, Author Sydney Sherman. It's not my other page, which is Sydney Sherman Author. This is Author Sydney Sherman. Uh, you can email me at sydneyshermanauthoryahoo.com. You can visit my website at sydneyshermanauthor.com. Everything Sydney Sherman. I just, you know what it is. Um, and again, I have the new uh, podcast, The Sarcastic Psychic, which is now on Spotify, which is exciting. Um, so you stop by and give a listen to that as well. And please send me any questions or any thoughts, ideas, programs you want for the uh, podcast. And that's great. So we're all back again. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to stop talking just for a second. And I'm going and actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to let Peggy come in in a minute. So I want to get this taken care of. So just a couple of recaps about reincarnation, a little more uh, information. First of all, the evidence is overwhelming. And I just touched the tip of the iceberg. I could have probably done a three-hour program and Cynthia would have been, I want to go to home. I want to go to bed. Um, just on all the information I found out, it is out there. 
please do not get a book that's written by somebody on reincarnation unless they wrote it using all science footnotes, okay? You really got to go and take books on, um, on energy, on physics, on quantum physics, and put the information together, but it is there. The reason I'm telling people all the time is not to go and buy books, even like on auras, is if it's just a regular person writing it, they can write whatever they want. You want science. You want things that have been tested and proved. So the evidence is overwhelming. So why is this discussion not ever in a science or theory class? And how would it affect our life, our health, our relationships if we truly knew about our reincarnations, about our past lives, about our aura, which is all basically the same thing? How would we be different now? We'd be completely different. Would it change our lives? It would. So just to recap, the law of conservation of energy create, was created. It's always here. Does it make sense that we get the one time, as I said, Donna? Does it make sense that Donna only got to live one time? The Mayans, the Inuits, the Eskimos, as we discussed, discussed, they believe in taking on another body to make up for or relearn or attune for mistakes in order for them to reach a better existence in the next life. There's no evidence that we reincarnate, not that I have found yet. As a matter of fact, it says the opposite. There's no evidence that we reincarnate into a plant or a tree or a bunny or a snake or an ant. There's no evidence that we reincarnate into another energy form, not unlike ourselves. It's very clear that we reincarnated back into another form like ourselves. So that would be a human form. Source energy is reincarnated into some type of source host to allow for regrowth. We are source energy. So it's human to human, animal to animal, animal. That's what Aristotle said. So humans, human go to human and animals go to animals. So we are not going to reincarnate and become a deer. I'm sorry, Peggy, we're not. I think Peggy wanted to be a puppy. Aristotle actually wrote a lot of stuff on reincarnation too. Uh, also Homer, he was another uh, philosopher who also believed in reincarnation. And he says it's most common for life to initiate new life without a previous form and likeness. Within, excuse me, within a previous form or likeness. It's most common for life to initiate new life within a previous form and likeness. That's Homer. Again, how do you have a new life and you initiate it into a previous form of the same type of life? That's reincarnation. So proof. Here's just a couple of stories. I could have done 100, but again, Cynthia wants to go to bed at some point. So two-year-old, two-year-old boy named Sam claimed to have changed his father, John's diapers when he was a baby. He included comments of John's chronic cough and not being able to speak till John was two. He told stories of a sister that John had who was turned into a fish when tossed into water. She died. He stated he had worked out in the fields near Pennsylvania line and broke his leg when he fell in a hole. He would also hold on to his head and said, it hurts. That's how I died. Sam's grandfather, John's dad, Sam, did change John's diapers, obviously. He did work in a field near the Pennsylvania line, and he did fall and break his leg when he fell into a hole. He did, Sam, the grandfather, um, changed John's diapers. Obviously, it's his, it, that was his father. I'm sorry, that was his uh, son. He did have a sister who was murdered and thrown into the lake. And in fact, John's father did have chronic pleurisy as a child and did not speak till he was two. Grandpa Sam died of brain aneurysm. This hurts. That's how I died. Is that coincidence? Is Sam Jr., Sam Sr.? I don't know, but that seems pretty strange. The kid's only two years old. A two-year-old is not going to know all that stuff. They're just, they're just not going to. All right. This one kind of freaked me a little bit, but um, an 85-year-old woman named Nemenda from Bulgaria told a caretaker just before her death that she was really a young woman named Celia from the western coast of Africa. She said she was born to a man and woman with many children. Her father sold her to a man who owned a millet farm when she was 15 years old. She said he beat and impregnated her. She had a daughter, Celia, that she named Fridem or Freedom. Fridem was taken from Celia at three months. Celia killed the man and threw his body into the fireplace. 
His last name was Newsom. Celia ran, but was found and murdered with oil and fire. Upon Namenda's death, the caretaker did research based on the information that Namenda had provided. One year later, she found the woman named Freedom. Um, and Freedom says that, yes, she did know, she didn't know too much about, but she knew that um, her mother's name was Celia. She stated she did not know anything about her mother other than the name and that she was taken as a slave by a man at 15 who owned a millet farm. She said she knows that her mother was murdered and her mother killed the man. She didn't know the man's name of the fact that she thought it was Newman. Now, remember, the man's name was Newsome. That's pretty darn close. Um, Celia was born 5-5-1855. Namenda was born 5-5-1935, 80 years between them. Oh, and Celia had two birthmarks that looked like full and half moons on her right hand. So did Namenda. Thoughts? I mean, I have lots of thoughts. First of all, that's not family to family, which they say it can happen, but she's, that's number one. Why is she wait till... She obviously knew all this information. Why did she wait till her deathbed? I don't know. Um, I, I just, I just, I have some issues with this story. Not that I don't think it's real. I think it's real, but I just have questions. Like if I, if I knew all this time that I was somebody else, I don't think I'd wait till my deathbed to to speak it. Um, I think I'd reach out and try to find the person. That's, that's what I think I'd do. But that's that's me. And the last one, this one you probably heard about. It's been on TV, but I thought it was amazing. A six-year-old boy named James draws pictures of airplanes, war crafts. He told his parents stories of his plane and how he was attacked and shot down. Airplane crash on fire. Little man get, can't get out. He would talk about his plane, the make, the model, even the name he had emblazed on the side. He would play with his plane and do pre-flight checks. One of his planes his mother bought had what appeared to be a bomb attached underneath. He corrected her and said, no, mom, that's a drop tank. <laughs> he told his parents and researchers that his plane was hit by the Japanese and that he was in a Corsair they used to get flat tires all the time. He identified the boat that he took off from named Toma, and his flight friend was Jack Larson. FYI, they did find Jack Larson living in Arkansas. James would say his real name was James Houston Jr., and that was the only one from the, he was the only one from his squadron killed at Iwo Jima. So facts were checked multiple times. They're still being checked. This is years later. All were true. And Jack Larson says, after spending the afternoon with the six-year-old boy, little James is James Houston. He could not have known the things he did. I'm completely convinced. So how do we know if we've been reincarnated? Sometimes we can't tell, sometimes we just can't. However, the theory is that we all have been multiple times, but we can look for certain things. The reoccurrent dreams. Um, Peggy and I are gonna share some stories in a second about reoccurrent dreams, and so we'll talk more about that. Memories we have, but wonder if they really happened. This happens to me all the time, or out of the blue, something happens to me, and I'm like, oh my God, I've forgotten all about, that. did that really happen? And I try to really analyze it, where it happened to the point where I would go to some of my friends from grammar school and say, did that really happen? I can't remember that. And it's that kind of thing with memories that you have to question if they really happen. Being brought, uh, born to, uh, excuse me, drawn to a certain time or place like you belong there. Donna, you said before, if you ever came into my house, my living room, you think it was the mid 1800s because I am just drawn to that time. I like the furniture, I like the culture, I like the design. I am, I'm just drawn, I'm, I'm, I'm a habitual watcher of gun smoke. I have to, it's just, you know, that's the time period. And I really feel, I don't, I could tell you I don't belong here right now. I don't, I don't. Uh, dreams of death in full or in pieces. And I'm gonna explain that later. Common traits with their family members who have passed, like birthmarks in the same place. Colics, widow peaks, pointed ears, and not like Spock. Lack of molars, piercing marks, even though you've never been pierced, piercing marks. ESP, 
scars with no injuries. And I wrote a few more down here that I found recently. Use of timed, they call timed speech, like whom instead of who, or regards instead of, you know, talk to you soon or whatever else. Uh, words like sincere. It's just words that aren't really used in our normal speech now. It's called older English or something like that. So those kind of words. The lazy eye, I think I, I mentioned before. Um, floaters. I just read this one the other day and I have floaters like crazy. And people who have floaters, there's a reason if they have the nor normal like little tear floaters, that's actually normal. But there's other people that get floaters because of the shape of their retina or their eye. And that's what my problem is. And so I'm reincarnated from somebody, several people who probably had the same thing. So floaters is huge. Uh, songs in the head, a reoccurring song over and over again, maybe even not from your generation of what you would normally even listen to. Maybe you like country and it's pop or something like that. So there's many, many, many different things to look for. You do have to be, um, you know, be careful, but there's ways to validate Donna. <laughs> there's ways to validate whether or not that you have had these past life regressions. So I'm gonna let Peggy tell her little story about the dream. Then I'm gonna come tell you about my coming to understand myself. Go ahead, Peggy. Thank you. Happy birthday, Peggy. <laughs> so ever since I was little, I've had constant dreams about being up in an attic where uh, the levers in the corner of the house, uh, looking out the window and seeing men uh, in uniforms with guns walking down the street. Um, there was many of us in the attic, including children. Now, I was a child at the time when I first started these dreams, but I felt like I was an adult in that dream, not one of the children. Um, I still occasionally have the dream, not as much as I used to, um, but I, I've also had dreams of running into a tunnel with an airplane flying over shooting, uh, the airplanes, like with the, the, the four propellers on the front and people running into a tunnel, trying to get away from them. The other day a plane that looked just like that flew over so, so close. It was just like, I could reach up and touch it. And it scared the crap out of me because I, you know, I'd see in this plane and I was wait, waiting for them to start shooting. So it's, uh, you know, are they just dreams or is it my past life? So I don't know. Um, my uh, my oldest son, when he was two, we were driving home and he asked me where his uniform was. Of course, the first thing I thought was my um, my father, who was a firefighter who died way before he was born. And uh, so I, I didn't say anything to him about it. And but then I was doing some family history. And um, uh, my great great grandfather, when he was 24 years old in the Civil War, was shot in the in the head at the age of 24. My son, at the age of 24, uh, was diagnosed with brain cancer. Um, it, it was on the same side, same side, same age. But my great great grandfather was also shot in the foot. And that same son has a mark on his same foot that he doesn't know what it is. Uh -huh. So I don't know. It's, it's just, it's too much of a coincidence. He and I spent a lot of time together and I've heard the story before and I did see the picture. She sent me the picture of the plane and I couldn't believe it how low it was down. I, that, I don't even think that was safe. I don't care what reason, parade or whatever they were doing. I didn't like that. But Peggy, do you feel like that if you were talking about the time you were running into the bridge, into the tunnel with everybody the plane's gone, would you say that was like a World War II thing maybe? Like yes. around that time? Yes. Okay. So, so to me, it seemed to be two different reincarnations. One was Civil War, 
type yeah. uniforms, and the other was um, the World War II. Okay. Or, or so you know this World this one, so this is the kind of stuff, Donna, that I'm researching right now, and I'm getting all the parts and pieces. <clears throat> Some people keep be, being able to reincarnate back into certain times and periods. So maybe for Peggy, it would be war types times and stuff like that. I, I don't know, but I'm just trying to put pieces together, things that I've researched and I've learned. Uh, so me, I don't, you know, my story, I've always wondered if I've been reincarnated, but I now now I know because I've checked into it. I, I mean, I really feel like my gut tells me and I just know the science fits it. So um, I have, um, I was born in 1962, as I said, and um, I had had a cousin who had passed away a year before I was ever born. I didn't know her and I didn't even know she exists. Uh, she existed. Her mother was made my godmother um, when, when I was born. I think that my parents did that to help with the loss of their daughter. But all I ever knew was that they had a daughter named Deanna. They had one daughter, no other children, Deanna. I would repeatedly tell my mother stories from the time I was a child. Uh, about the fact, I keep asking you, mom, where's my blue dress with the yellow dots in it? And the mother would look at me, she goes, you don't have them. I guess not. I do, mom. I says, I used to, I wear it all the time. Where did I like that dress? No, you don't have a dress like that. Um, I've always loved the water, but I have fear of certain water, certain water. And Peggy, you can tell, I love the ocean. I mean, I'm drawn to the ocean. I love the Certain water freaks me out, but otherwise, you know, I love it. Um, I would have dreams of drowning when I was a kid all the time. Yeah. And um, I, my mother said, you know, you, you don't really have nightmares like normal kids, but it's always drowning. It's always drowning. It's always drowning. Okay. So when I got a little bit older and I was over my auntie aunt's house, who's my godmother, we didn't really go over there that often. Um, you know, I'm in the part of the house that I'd never been in for it was their den. You we know, was in the living room. That's we living in the kitchen. And I happened to look up on the bookshelf in the wall. And here's a picture of two girls side by side, one of those frames that open up like this and the girls are on each side. And I, and there's me, me wearing that dress. And I'm like, oh, I said, I knew I wore that dress. I said, oh, yeah. I said, I tell my mother all the time. I says, I wore that dress. And I says, well, you know, why do you have that picture? And then duh, she's my godmother. So of course she would. And she says, no, sweetheart. She goes, that's not you. She goes, that's Darlene. I said, who's Darlene? She goes, Darlene is the daughter that I lost. She says, about a year. She goes, almost exactly a year before you were wow. born. Wow. And I said, I never heard. I mean, I was like 16 years old. And I was like, I never, she goes, we don't, we don't talk about her. She goes, everybody's very good in the family. She goes, it was a horrific time. And, uh, and I said, but I know I wore that dress. And she goes, sweetheart, she goes, you did not wear that dress. So that's when I told her that I, I she started saying, why do you think you wore that dress? So I told her. Then I started saying to her, I said, you know, I was wearing that day, the, the dress, the day that I fell in the water and I was pulled into the tube. I'm 16 telling her this. And it's like coming out of my mouth without me even thinking about why I'm saying it. Yeah. I, to I told my mother this story. I told my mother a million times. And she explained to me that Darlene was eight years old. And my Darlene was down by this little dam in Orange by their house. And they used to walk across the little dam. Well, her father was working on the bridge that was slightly down from the dam. And in order to fix this bridge, they had to dredge the water out. So she's walking across the dam with her friends. She fell into the water. The suction on the other side that's dredging the water out pulled her into the tube. Now here's her father, my uncle, hanging over the side, grabbing onto her for dear life. The machine would not shut off. They were trying to shut the stupid machine off and they wouldn't. And as I'm telling her, I'm telling her the story that I remember falling in there. And I remember Uncle George reaching down, trying to grab me and everything. And I remember feeling like I can't breathe. And I remember thinking everything was dark, but I kept feeling stuff hitting my face and hitting my face and hitting my face. And, and all of a sudden I just felt his hand let go. And she's just looking at me kind of in shock. And she, she told me how um, Darlene had died. And that's exactly what happened with Darlene. She was pulled into that tube. She never came out the other side. They had to go in there and, and, and remove her. Uh, but she was wearing that dress. And I knew at that time, there's no way, because it wasn't discussed in our family, 
something's weird, but I'm already thinking, I'm, well, maybe I just saw the ghost of her. Maybe she comes to me as a ghost. Maybe that's how I know the story. I mean, honestly, this is what I'm thinking. And I have some very weird trademarks on me. I have a pop mark on my head right here. I have a tilted cross tooth on, I think you see it right here. I have two birthmarks on my back, right under here underneath my arm. I always attributed them to my Auntie Joyce, completely different lady, because I look a lot like her. Well, as I've come into this new thought process, I asked my father, I said, Dad, do you have any pictures? Because Auntie Anne's died. I said, do you have any pictures of Darlene and Deanna? Yeah, he does. He actually had a lot. And so I was going through them last time that they came over here, going through all these pictures. And here she is, there's one of them, her, her in a bathing suit. And I swear if I'm looking at her from a side profile, I'm like, that's my face. That's like, okay, so we're cousins. So it could very well be, right? You know, but here she is in this little, 60s bathing suit, right, that little girls used to wear. And right here on the side, right here on the side, these two kind of strange, kind of like almost like look like pom-pom birthmarks. So that was number one. Number two, there was a real, you know how we all go through school and we get our school pictures and every one of us at a certain age, we get a little gawky. We just look kind of like gawky, yeah. now, right? There was a picture of her and she was in um, third, I think it was third grade. It was the same year as she died. I'm pretty sure it was third grade. And she's got this big dorky smile on her face. And the tooth is turned. Mm -hmm. And then my father told me that her, her mother, my auntie Anne, used to always keep the bangs down. She had that look, the, the bangs that came straight down like her hair was straight because she had three, I have one, three pop marks on her face. So beside that and never many, many other things. The biggest thing is she died July 21st, 1961. I was born July 21st, 1962. I am, I am Darlene. There's too many things that I know. There's a lot of fears that I have for no reason. And that's another thing, fears of things that you don't know why you have the fears that you have. Um, and personality traits. I am, of course, I say sarcastic. My aunt would tell me when I was younger that of the two girls, De Deanna was quiet. Darlene was the more boisterous, sarcastic one. So there's my little story. There's more in-depth things that I've done. There's things that I've been able to do to research to see if that's true. I do feel like I'm also a couple other people in my family, but I'm not going to take up the time to get into it. Um, but yes, I don't care what anybody says. The science is there. I can see it for myself in many, many, many ways. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm trying to work on helping to define how other people can pull things out themselves to match up so they can get their own answers. It's not hard. It really isn't. I think people actually know themselves because as people are telling me this is coming out of their mouth, it's almost like, oh yeah, and the light's coming off. Um, but it's, I just need to get a little more better before I continue helping guide people with this. So with that being said, um, questions, anybody want to share their reincarnations or what they think? All I can do is tell you with the knowledge I have right now of whether I think the, the opportunity is there or the chance is there. I'll tell you a quick story if I might share with you. Yep. A couple of years ago, I was in uh, Jordan and we were on the um, Dead Sea side of Jordan. And I took a couple of hours one afternoon to go into a spa and they put all of the mud from the Dead Sea on you. It's like a facial kind of thing. They cover you with mud and then they turn on this very quiet music and they leave you for like 15 or 20 minutes. And during that time, you just kind of like go into yourself. And you know, it's like a picture, you're looking at a picture and then it pulls out and comes back, you know, and all of a sudden you're out in the universe, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden I was walking with my tribe of people through the desert in Wadi Rum, Georgia, uh, Jordan. Wadi Rum is where a um, um, couple of very famous uh, movies were filmed and there's a famous guy, I can't remember. But I looked around as I was laying in my, you know, on this bed covered with mud. I looked around and I was covered in these long robes and I was, we were trudging through the desert and I was with my people. I wasn't with a man, there weren't with children near me, but I know that that was, I had lived there. I know that I had lived, 
I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of years ago, but I, I was there. It was very, um, very powerful. I was like, oh my God, I just knew it. I knew that I had been there. So let me ask you something, Donna. Do you think this putting this mud on you helped bring that forward? Probably. So let it's me part, explain. From the Dead Sea, you know, in, in, in that part of the uh, Middle East. Very powerful. So let me explain something to you that I'm learning, which makes sense. When we do the aura presentations and everything, and Cynthia has heard the presentation before, we talk about the fact that we are closely related to the minerals in the ground, the salts, the nitrates, the phosphorus, even the coppers, that we mimic a lot of the stuff. So we mimic the stars in the solar system. All the same stuff that creates the stars in the solar system is in our DNA and in our body. So that's all energy. So we're all connected. There is a thing that a lot of native tribes do, they still do to this day, yeah. when they're doing their, um, what they call cosmic exchange, or when they're looking for their periods of enlightenment, a lot of Asian cultures do it. And they will use ground stone, or they will use mud, or they'll use kelp, depending on when they live, something in a natural form, and they will smear it on their body. What this does is the same thing as smelling a scent that's familiar or pleasing, it reacts with the pineal or pineal gland in the center of the brain, which is called the third eye. It's called the third eye for a reason. And it's responsible for opening you up and bringing greater awareness through this combination of using like-minded things like minerals and compounds and stuff like that. And that's what they do. So when you said you smeared your body with the, the Dead Sea, you know, so I mean, for that area, maybe that's what brings it out. And for some other area, it might be something else. But it could very well be that your body went through this pineal exchange or pineal exchange because you put the mud on you and your body brought you back and allowed you to have a period of enlightenment. Because I'm telling you, I've, I've been doing that. I've been taking my stone. And again, I do lies in my aura presentation. I've been taking my stone. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Yeah. Long story about stones. But I've been using it to try to bring myself back. Holding, I, we, Peggy and I are also Reiki masters. We do Reiki. So everything's energy with us. And I'm using it to try to spring myself back. And I've been coming up with a lot of things that are helping me understand why things happened in my life, why I'm fearful of certain things, why I have such distaste for certain things. Let me interrupt um, you there. You have fears. Yep. I, I have a debilitating fear of heights. I can no longer drive on highways because going over bridges is really debilitating. One, one year I um, went to Israel and going through JFK, then going through London Heathrow, all of the glass in the airport threw me off and it just really disrupted all my chakras. And a, a kind woman sitting next to me from Heathrow to, to Israel, she helped me walk through the airport because she knew how disoriented I was. So I stay on a kibbutz on the Sea of Galilee and they had an energy healer there. And while everybody went off to do their thing, I said, can you do a energy healing on me? Because my whole chakras were thrown off from going through the airport and, and my fear of heights and all of that stuff. She did an energy healing on me and told me that in a previous life, I was a pilot and my plane crashed. And that was part, and I tried to rationalize it. Number one, I was a man in a previous life and it could have been the most previous, previous life because of when planes were invented, when, like 1920 or 1917 or something like that, the right yeah. was right? So I had to do an immediate past life. I was a man and that could account for my fear of heights coming down on the plane and crashing. So she had to get all my chakras back in alignment in order for me to continue on my journey. You know, that's it. That's interesting because obviously, and again, remember I said I have, I love water, but there's some things I'm fearful of water about, obviously. Yeah. Now you don't mind traveling. You sound like you're a traveling person. So you fly, mm -hmm. right? You fly. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you don't mind flying. You love flying. You're getting on planes. You're going all over the place. But yet, there's a there's something in there that that fear of, of the of the crashing. 
So that would see that to me would make sense. You're still doing what you enjoy doing it. And if you were a pilot, you would have enjoyed doing it too, right? That's why you became a pilot. But then there's that fear of the crash or the or the falling or something like that. Um, I have a feeling something tells me I've never met you before, Peggy. I don't know if you're thinking the same thing. I'm not. I can't give you. I, I have a feeling you're probably a life color. You're probably a blue or a violet, right, Peggy? Just because of the stories that you tell, but I can't say certainly. That would make you even more receptive to these kind of things. Um, easier for you to understand them. Easier for you to have these experiences. So. Um, but again, I can't say that by looking at you here, just some of the things you're saying, I could be wrong, but I doubt it highly. Um, Cynthia, did you have any stories and was our friends still back there? No, do you have any? Um, I, I have one thing I, I could share, um, myself and that is that I've had a lot of dreams and I don't know what this means, but I've had a lot of dreams, um, where I'm like, going off the like on a bridge and going off a bridge with in a car so sometimes I wonder it seems to be a reoccurring dream and I wonder sometimes about it um, is is it the same kind of car same situation same bridge um you know I, I'm not sure it's it could be it could be um it just seems to be like I go off and fall but and I feel the sensation of falling but that's about it. So I don't know. It's a, so let me tell you what I found out about. And again, I can't tell you from just that, but most people would think the right answer would be yes, it's the same bridge every time I'm doing the same thing, the same songs on the radio, blah, 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 blah. That's actually more the sciences have proved of just a th of something that you've been through the mind creating something. It's more of a, huh, one time I was in San Francisco and I just, I feel I went off a bridge and, and I'm driving to Maine and there was a bridge and the, the car fell. It's things like that that actually leave more credence to just this fear that you have of bridges in general. Yeah, I do have a fear of bridges, yeah. So that's what people think right away. They have to say, oh yeah, same bridge, same song on the radio, same, and actually that's not it. So I'm learning that there's this things that you can pull out of stories that people tell that are more traditionally what would be reincarnation and more with the really weird thing the brain does with creating stories. But when brain creates stories, it usually creates the same like-minded story. I'm in California, it's this bridge, it's this car, it's white, it's a station wagon, the Rocky Mountain High was on the radio, you know, that kind of thing. Why did I just say Rocky Mountain High? <sighs> anyway, um, did your lovely guest back there have a, any kind of questions or thoughts about reincarnation or? Uh, Hi there, come, come stay with us. <laughs> We're having fun. Here, Look at this is a, this is like a little campfire, no, right? No, no, no. Can you see okay. me? Careful, but not too bright. Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay. Jackie. Okay. Speak for yourself. Yeah. All right. I can I can I can only see the top part of your. Now I can't even see the top part of your head. Can we angle down the? Um, there okay. you go. You Hi. First of all, thank Hi. you for okay. coming. My name is Jill. Hi, Jill. I met you several times. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. I wanted to tell you when I was in college, I was fascinated with dreams. I have a lot of dreams. I'm an artist. I'm very creative. So I decided, she said, you know, you have to do a, a essay. So I decided I'm going to do dream analysis. So I got every book out of the library that I could find. And my big six month project was to write this big paper on dream analysis, like when people are falling and what, if there's a bear chasing you, that kind of stuff. And everything's linked back to your childhood, really, and and traumatic experiences that you had when you were a little kid, or you know things that had happened while you're growing up, and um, you know it it kind of explains that if you have something that happens to you over and over again and you're very fearful, you have to almost be awake in your dreams and say, okay, bear, you're not going to get me this time, and then it goes away, and it mm -hmm. works. I tried it; it actually works. So, um, and it, and of course your dreams change as you get older, because you suddenly become fearful of things that you didn't even know you were afraid of, you know, right. that, obviously as you age, but, um, uh, it's very interesting. I think if you do a little research on that, you might find some of the answers you're looking for, um, through dream analysis. Do you dream? Do you have, do you have uh, regular, I have dreaming? 
my dreams are very lifelike and very real. It's like, um, and I remember them very, very well. Sometimes they're haunting. Uh, but I actually, my friend, when I was doing my uh, post master's thesis, I did it on dream, not dream analysis, but oh, um, cool. the, the, wake, the wake dream state. Yeah. And so there is, first of all, the brain is a wonderful thing. It can take care of more things than we can even imagine. It does all sorts of things without us even thinking about it. But yes, there's a difference between dreams. A dream of when you're talking to a loved one, are they really there? Are they talking in a dream or is it just your brain? There's a way to figure that out. Going back and using that for repressed feelings of things that happened to you and abusive things as children or incidents or PTSD or whatever else. Right, right. There is the way that dreams can also reflect to you periods of time where you were born in another body as we've talked, where it wasn't really you, but you have these remembrances. So the brain has like, I think if I can remember correctly, and I got them, that was a long time ago. There are 16 sets of different types of dreams. Um, yeah. But yes, you are absolutely right. You can yeah. take some dreams and you can actually work them backwards. And if you're awake in these dreams, you can say, I'm not going to fear you anymore. Yeah. I'm stop. I'm not going to listen anymore. This is not true. You can give it thought or you can give it power. Yes. And, you know, um, so that's very funny you said that because that was probably the worst paper I had to write. <laughs> but, I um, but I did. <laughs> uh, but it's very interesting when you delve into all the stuff the brain does. It's just very, very interesting. And the, the first part is similar to how you say um, to connect with your relatives. The first part is you have to learn to write down your dreams right after you have them, because as soon as you get up and start walking around, you forget. Yep. You have so many every night and uh, you can only probably remember one or two, but we have several. And, uh, and some people never remember any of their dreams. And I, yeah. I don't, it, you have to practice it. You do. And there's a method to, it's just like, um, it's like, what's his name? I just had it in my head here. The, uh, the guy that did the Astro travel, um, Edgar Casey. if you ever heard of him, he actually wrote a book on using the mind to create the reality in your wake state that you want in your dreams and vice versa. Wow. Um, and again, it was using that power of the brain, as you said, to recollect things quickly because your brain does move on to another thing and to remember for your mind to recollect things over a period of time. Cause you're right. Once you get out of that REM sleep, yes. your brain quickly starts to lose the ability to remember either small nuances of the dream, the whole dream, or how many times you had a dream. Um, but you can, you can stop that. So it's, um, I love this subject, <laughs> it's like, but again, it's a thing that your brain, you've been given a brain. It's a wonderful thing that you personally and all of us can do if we learn how to master it. I've taken your advice. I try to lay in bed at night and talk to my dead relatives and say, you know, I'm ready for you. Mm -hmm. If you need to tell me something, let's go. And I'm not getting very far with it. <laughs> I am, I am so sorry. What's your first name again? Jill. See, my memory stinks. See, Jill, I am positive. I did not tell you to start that way. And you know why? Because you are not going to get anything like that from them. You're not going to hear them. You're not going to see them until you you've done the smelling. You in, the, in their dreams. You told me they come Oh, to in you. your dream. Okay. So yes, in the morning when you wake up. You well, say I, if, I talk to them before I fall asleep and say, yeah. if there's something that you need to know or you need to tell me, come to me in my dreams. And then when I get up in the morning, there's nothing. Okay, so let me start all over again with that dream. So okay. what I said is if they come to you in your dream, yeah, you can ask them to come in the dream, but if you wake up in the morning and they didn't come to you in a dream, then there's no point in going through the, hey, you know, what I taught you. If you have a dream of them, yeah. if you do, that's when you, when you wake up in the morning, you say, okay, thanks for coming in my dream, mom. You looked great. I always hated that dress. Don't know why you came to me in that dress because you know I was, it was disgusting when you had it. I don't know why you're still wearing it. You know, talk to my and then, but that's great. But I need to see you here right now. That's when that connection is made. I got you. So unless you have that, if you didn't have a dream about them, I mean, I'm not telling you not to reach out to them. And I'm certainly not telling you, I would say, you know, come to me in the dream because I want to hear what you just have to say. Absolutely. Uh, but it works better when you've actually had the dream. But start with the smelling first and the yeah. feeling that's easier. 
to do than trying to get into the dreams, especially when you haven't actually seen them in the dream yet. Yeah. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and again, our brain's a wonderful thing. And that pineal gland in the center of the brain and your aura, it's responsible for everything. Everything you do, everything you say, everybody you meet, every experience you've had, everything your body can do, um, it's responsible for. And we all have one, we all have both of them. So the sky's the limit. So um, I guarantee you, we've all had reincarnation experiences. We just have to realize, you know, a lot of people said to me too, but, but Sydney, why do I care about my past life? Why do, why do I care about it? And then some people, you may not, you may not care because you don't feel it affects you anyway. This is the life you're living right now. And there's nothing wrong with that. But in another way, it could help you. That's the name of the program that I developed for past lives. It could help you understand why it is that you are the way you are today. Right. So, and you can have reincarnation and past life. They do go hand in hand, but they mean two different things. So, uh, Cynthia, are you still there or, are you, or did you yeah. go home? I don't know. I'm still here. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Okay. Did anybody have any more questions? Anybody have, I don't know, anything? I just have one quick question and then I'm going to run. Did you ever read the book called Life Between Lives by Michael Newton? Mm -mm. Fascinating. You should read it. Like Life Between Lives? Life Between Lives. When we die, we go back to wherever we go back. And we kind of reprogram ourselves. We relearn and do what we need to do before we select our new life to come back and re reincarnate. It's a very small book. It took me forever to read it because I had to read a paragraph and reread that paragraph because it was something my brain couldn't wrap around. It was the most fascinating book, Life Between Lives by Michael, uh, Michael Newton. Fascinating does, book. Does Let me ask you something. Does he... Um... Does he reference science books or is it all? Oh yeah, he does okay. past life. He does uh, a lot of, he's from California. He does past life regressions. So all of the things you're talking about, the little boy and, you know, he has many, many stories, but it's all from his work in, okay. in your field. And he's, he's very renowned. I will, I will definitely look for that. And I appreciate you telling me about it. Life Between Lives. And he has a second book. Um, I can't remember what it is. Um, I'm, I've got him, got him on my other screen here. But it, I could only read like a paragraph or one page because I had to reread it to, to let it all sink in. Mm -hmm. I'll probably go and reread it now after this session. But okay. it's very fascinating. If you haven't read it, you should definitely look at I will I will definitely look into it as my husband says I'm not really a a reader I do a lot of research reading uh but if I do find a good book especially something if I'm trying to learn like right now I will read the heck out of it so thank yeah, you yeah. For, for telling me about that I'm gonna I'm going to leave you ladies um but thank you very much Sydney for your um evening I oh well, thank you for attending if you have any questions you have my email uh, message me check out my you know what uh, check out my podcast i've had six people check it out and that's sad <laughs> so, the sarcastic psychic come on okay I have some notes here I'll see you oh, thank you again thank you thank you thank you um, cynthia thank you, thank you as always thank you very much sydney all right, all right. thank you have a good night Bye, be safe cynthia. going on good night guys Bye. Good night. Bye.